The dinner hour had come and gone. John put down the quill and reached for the loaf of bread sitting on the table. He broke off a piece and held it in his hand. The action triggered a memory of days long past, of a meal that Jesus and the disciples shared in a home in Bethany. This little village was just two miles east of Jerusalem on the Jericho Road, which made it an ideal place for them to stay when they were in the area. It also didn't hurt that Bethany was the home of a woman named Martha, who was an excellent host and cook. Martha lived there with her sister Mary and her brother Lazarus. They were all good friends of Jesus and often extended an invitation for him and the disciples to dine there. One evening, the disciples arrived to see Martha performing her typical duties, making sure the food was prepared and the guests were all happy and the details were covered. Evidently, she had assumed that her sister would help, but either Mary didn't get the message or she ignored it. And when John walked into the main room, he saw Mary sitting at Jesus' feet, listening to him teach. And John thought it was peculiar, but since it didn't seem to bother Jesus, it didn't bother him. But boy, it certainly bothered Martha. As the evening shadows grew longer, John could tell that her patience with her sister was running shorter. The tension was building in the house, and eventually it erupted. Lord, and exasperated, Martha finally declared to Jesus, Don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work all by myself? Tell her to help me. John didn't often hear his master addressed in this manner. Jesus paused his teaching and replied, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. And Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. John put the bread in his mouth and chuckled. These were happy occasions, times shared with friends and family. But as Jesus' ministry drew to a close, those moments grew few and far between. Events were moving forward that would soon lead Jesus to his death on the cross, a penalty that he would pay so we would never again have to be separated from God. Jesus' healing of the blind man set off a debate in Jerusalem and caused him to have to retreat across the Jordan River. It was there he received a message from Martha and Mary that their brother had fallen ill. The message was simple but urgent. Lord, the one you love is sick. It didn't look good for Lazarus. But fortunately, he had something going for him, or better stated, he had someone going for him, for Jesus was a close friend. Christ responded with a promise of help. Lazarus' sickness will not end in death, he said. It would have been easy for the messenger to misunderstand the statement and believe that Lazarus would not face death. But Jesus made a different promise. This sickness will not end in death. Lazarus would find himself in the valley of death, but he would not stay there. So the days came and went, and Lazarus began to fade. No Jesus, no help. Finally, Jesus told the disciples the time had come to return to Bethany. And John remembered the scene when they arrived. By this time, Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days. No help from Christ and now no hope. Mary and Martha were disappointed and confused. And it was Martha who reached them first. Lord, she said, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus' response was direct. Your brother will rise again, he said. Yes, Martha replied. He will rise when everyone else rises at the last day. And Jesus looked at her a moment and said, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Do you believe this? Can you feel the drama in that moment? Jesus was asking this heartbroken sister, do you believe? He was asking it in the vicinity of the cemetery. He was asking it four days too late because Lazarus was four days dead and buried. Do you believe? <laughs> it's the same question Jesus asks us when we find ourselves in the middle of that valley of death. 
when all hope seems lost and Jesus' help seems missing? John could barely make out Martha's quiet reply. Every stride and step brings you closer to your final one. Each beat of the heart is the click of a countdown clock. Your days are measured. And no matter how well you run this race, you will not run it forever. And when that time comes, you will need Jesus' help to enter your eternal home. Thankfully, that help has already been given. The invitation has been made. The price has been paid for the raising of Lazarus from the dead was only a small hint of the greater resurrection to come. The religious leaders had been angry at the miracle of the healing of the blind man, but this miracle caused them to fear. If we let him go on like this, they said, everyone will believe in him and then the Romans will come and take away our temple and our nation. Soon plans were in motion to forever end the threat that Jesus represented. For John, time passed like a blur, a Passover meal, a foot washing ceremony, a sleepy journey to a garden at night, a betrayal followed by Roman torches and Roman swords, a mock trial and a sentence of death. All of the disciples fled the scene. Only one among them had received money to betray Christ, but all of them abandoned him in his time of need. John alone returned to the outskirts of the city to stand with Jesus' mother at the foot of the cross. And the hours passed. At noontime, a darkness descended upon the land, and at three o'clock, Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And for the first time, Jesus had been cut off from the fellowship with the Father. God had put the sins of humanity on him and the judgment for those sins. A holy God could not look at the unholiness of sin. And in that moment, Jesus was entirely alone. John watched as a sponge soaked in wine vinegar was lifted to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. It is finished. In the Greek language, the phrase is the single word, to telestai. It's a holy word, a sacred point in time. The moment the artist steps back from the canvas and lowers his brush, it is finished. This was not a surrender, but a declaration, a victory cry. With this single proclamation, Jesus fed more than a crowd, still more than a storm, and gave sight to more than one man. His command at Bethany had been enough to call Lazarus from the grave. His announcement at Calvary was sufficient to save all who believe in him from eternal death. Jesus' statement indicated a tremendous debt had been erased. Indeed, the Greek word tetelestai carries overtones of a business term. It was used to signify paid in full on debts such as levies or a tribute that a transaction had been finalized, as the author of Hebrews would later state, for by one sacrifice, Christ has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. No further offering is needed. Heaven awaits no additional sacrifice. The work of Christ on the cross satisfied the demands of the eternal tribunal. The greatest of the miracles John records in his gospel, humanity, had been redeemed. This fact was emphasized at the moment of Jesus' death when the curtain in the Holy of Holies was torn in two. This veil in the temple had served to separate sinful humans from a holy God, but that separation would be no more. Yet another promise that we are never alone. We typically think of redeemed as a New Testament word, but its roots are in the Israelites' exodus from Egypt. When God struck Egypt with the final plague, it resulted in the death of the firstborn. Throughout the land of Egypt, every firstborn male was killed in a single night, both animals and people. The Jewish people later referred to that moment as Passover because the spirit of death passed over those who had marked the doors of their homes with the blood of a lamb. The firstborn in those households were spared, but a price was paid. Later, God said to Moses, consecrate to me all the firstborn. 
Whatever opens the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and beast, it is mine. In other words, God had claimed every firstborn within Israel for himself. The firstborn among the animals were sacrificed as an offering of worship. But when it came to people, the Lord said to Moses, All the firstborn of man among your sons you shall redeem. There it is, redemption. The firstborn of each Israelite family legally belonged to God, but God allowed each family to reclaim their child to redeem him or her by paying a price. It was a legal transaction. Ownership transferred once the debt was paid. Freedom granted for a fee. Jesus did the same for us on the cross. He he paid the price to set us free because none of us can pay that debt on our own. We need his help. We need his redemption. Paul said it this way, for our sake, God made Christ to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. There is also a legal transaction, the supernatural transfer of our sin to Christ and his righteousness to us. Jesus, God's sinless son, absorbed in himself our sinful state so that we, his rebellious creation, can receive the goodness of Christ. Our part is to simply receive this great miracle of mercy to let God's grace flow over us like a cleansing cascade, flushing out all dregs of guilt and shame. Nothing can separate us from God. Our conscience may accuse us, but God accepts us. Others may dredge up our past, but God does not. As far as he is concerned, the work is once and for all time finished. John lifted up another piece of bread and recalled the Passover meal that he had shared with Jesus on the night of his arrest. His Lord had picked up the bread as was customary at this point, given thanks for it, broken it, and then said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Neither he nor the other disciples fully understood the meaning of his words. They didn't comprehend that Jesus The one who had declared to be the bread of life was announcing his intent to give up his life so others might live. He was about to show the greatest act of love the world had ever known, to die for his friends. As the sunlight streamed into the room, John knew that because of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, he would never have to face the valley of the shadow of death alone. Jesus had gone before him and had conquered the grave. In the meantime, he would keep running the race, confident in the knowledge that his friend was waiting for him at the finish line. And when he crossed it, he wouldn't be surprised if he again heard those words from Jesus. It is finished.